This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. Jesus was talking about fulfilling the spirit of the Old Testament and not the letter. He didn't say that. Well, he did say on several... Every tittle shall be fulfilled. <laughs> he did say on several occasions, you've heard it was said in the old days, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He said, I say to you instead, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you. Time and again, he went beyond the old negativism with a new positivism. Let me give you an example. Let me give you a test. In five... What did you say? Bum, Yes. Now that the fanfare is out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you a test. For the next five seconds, try not to think of a turtle. Can you do it? Try not to think of a... Quite easily. I was just thinking of a rabbit instead. I was thinking instead of, of what? Ah, the point is that somewhere on some level of your consciousness, you have to be aware that a turtle is what you're trying not to think about. I wasn't. I decided I wanted to think about a rabbit, and I thought about a rabbit so to the exclusion of anything else in the universe. So but the rabbit the was... With a new positivism. <laughs> yes. So I replaced the old negativism with a new positivism. And besides, the rabbit you were thinking about was racing a turtle, right? <laughs> I've heard that story before. The point is, if you say to a child, don't think of a hippopotamus, the child has to remember to in his mind... an undeveloped child, yes, but to someone who's grown up and knows how to control his own mind, he has no trouble at all thinking about something else. The very fact that you had to think of something positive to drive out what you were not going to think of says that it's... What's positive it's, about a rabbit? Well, you had to hold a positive... I had to hold another thought in order to keep from thinking on something else. This is a very important principle. If you have to hold a positive in order to drive out a negative, then to hold love for other human beings and to hold the positive principles of love for God and man is higher than the simple making of a long list of things a person ought not to do. A series of negative commandments, and that's why Jesus was teaching positive commandments instead of negative ones. Okay. Yeah, okay! I don't believe in eternal life because I believe that... Um, when I die, like that's the end, and that's that's all there is to it. Uh, there are moments when you have second thoughts about this. Well, yeah, this is just <laughs> just every once in a while I get into this mood, you know, occasional aesthetic moods, and it's not. Like oh, I do believe in eternal life. For example, you take human personality, human will, human ability to love. You take compassion, character, any one of a number. In fact, all of a number of these, which are not, I believe, simply physical which are not material. I believe they are spiritual, that will and personality, character, love cannot be locked up in a coffin and dropped down six feet underground. I really do believe that something spiritual survives of man. Now, this is not a scientific judgment. This is a matter of faith, of course. Well, yeah, that is a, a matter of faith, and, and of course I respect your faith, but it, is, it isn't my faith, and it's also my feeling that I've had people tell me that uh, you know, I, I should accept Jesus for the reason that if I do, I'll live forever and have riches, riches in heaven, and therefore I should accept Jesus and go around, you know, treating my fellow man like a brother. But it seems to me that um, the real reason for treating my fellow man like a brother isn't just so that I will get rewards afterward. It shouldn't, in other words, just be because your fear of the temperature of hell and the love of the furniture of heaven, essentially. Right. It, it should be more more for a positive reason that I, I think it, it's the right thing yeah. to do here and now because it, it makes things better all the way around here and now for everybody concerned. My conviction is that there is this life beyond the grave. Certainly it's a portion of the traditional Jewish and Christian teachings even back in the 23rd Psalm, for example, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Incidentally, it's interesting that the word there is through. A person who walks through the valley of the shadow of death, he doesn't remain there, he doesn't stay there. There's this continual expectancy of looking for something beyond, of anticipation, which I'm convinced is there. When you look at a personality of another human being, when you recognize that person's character, that person's ability to love, show compassion, and do good things, his will, all the rest of this, does that seem completely physical to you? It, it seems to me that it could be very easily completely a function of, um, you know, biochemical things that go on in, in the brain and in the body. It doesn't change my attitude, you know, if toward my fellow man to believe that it is or isn't physical because... Um, in other words, you would say that your attitude toward your fellow human being would not be altered particularly dependent on whether or not you believe you are going to live after death. Yeah, that... I would say that one's attitude toward fellow human beings can be changed and is changed by whether or not he believes there is life after death in this sense, that you are much more willing and in a sense much more able to go into difficult situations, even situations which are perilous to you physically and which you might risk yourself 
for other human beings if you have this conviction that there will be life beyond. And that's another reason that it's interesting to note that many of the people who have been the greatest humanitarians, some of the greatest servants of other human beings, and who've gone out, such as Schweitzer to Lamborghini, and such as many of the other humanitarians who've gone out and done this sort of thing, have done so in the conviction that if I die doing this in service for my brothers, that's not the end of it. It's just the beginning. Now, that's a pretty powerful motivation in addition to being able to serve your fellow human beings. Well, yeah, that's also the, the same kind of argument in referring to war, that there are no atheists in the foxholes. But yet, to me, the idea of just death being the end isn't all that terrible anyway, that um, there is a certain peace promised of, of you know it's it's like a nothingness i think it's also interesting to note that all throughout nature you don't find creatures you don't find animals really preparing for something which does not come ultimately for instance you don't find squirrels gathering nuts for winter and then the winter doesn't come in another sense right well yeah that's true okay and in the same sense i would say that man gathers character for eternity in the same way that a squirrel gathers nuts for winter. And just as surely as the winter comes, I do believe the eternity comes, that a person does not spend his entire lifetime developing his character, his ability to love, his ability to make good decisions, to choose the good, to help other human beings, to understand philosophically and all the rest, and then have this all wiped out at one sweep of the hand. I really don't believe that's the way it is. I do believe there is life beyond. Are you ready for a grimsley terrible parable? Not really, but go ahead. Yes. It happened in Colorado by the Big Blue Mountain there. It seems that there was a honeymooning couple. An old timer was telling them a story one day about a legend that folks thereabouts told that one time a young couple went up Big Blue Mountain and never came back again. There was a long pause. The young man finally said, golly, what happened to him? The old timer stroked his grizzled chin and said they went down the other side. <laughs> yes. Now. In the same sense, we look up the mountain of death and we say, well, people haven't been coming back down from it. Where did they go? I think they went down the other side. I think that there's simply a continuation. There's something more beyond. As Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I am the resurrection and the life. As he said on other occasions, time and time again, he was talking about this possibility, this spiritual potential for life beyond the grave. He said those who are judged worthy of life in this other world are like angels, and that being judged worthy, <laughs> man is going to be accountable for what he does. What do you think of that? Of course. But God I, what? Not God, man is accountable for what man does. Good what did you say? Not, God is not accountable for what man does, or any gods, but man is accountable for you know, both, his, both his successes and his failures, and neither should be, well, blamed on anything. I, I Except on man himself. On man himself. In my judgment, <laughs> which somewhat varies with that, as you might imagine, man does have free will. Yes, man is free to choose, but he can choose the will of God. He can choose the higher path. He can choose peace or he can choose, well, as it says in the Old Testament, I said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing, make up your mind, essentially. And I think that in a world in which we have the choice between war and peace, where individual people have the choice between loving other people or not, between prejudice and broad-mindedness and tolerance, that these are not only earthly choices, human choices, these are choices choosing for God's dream or against God's dream for this planet, really. Well, um, I don't know about the concept of God's dream so much. Uh, you just hope he doesn't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, all right. Two points for you, Vern. <laughs> No, what I'm saying about God's dream is God's hope, God's plan for this planet, that if we were indeed created to live as one family, as a family of God, as brothers and members in one household on this earth, any act which we do, any decision which we as individuals make which contributes to that, is an act of high morality and high spirituality. Uh, I, I, I don't know so much about the idea that there is um, one plan or necessarily one design for the entire world. Uh, but. I would think, you know, it would, it would be just as uh, desirable if people would be a little more content to leave, just leave each other alone, you know, to, uh, you know, find their solutions as they see fit. Yes, as one statesman has said, the minimal rule of international politics is simply that you leave your neighboring nations alone. I will grant that if people did that on the personal level, too, we would have a much better world. But above and beyond simply not kicking people in the shins, not poking each other in the eye, not tweaking each other's nose, and all manner of other horrendous behavior, there is a positive realm. Jesus, I'm sure, if he had wanted to, could have made the longest list in the world by making a list of things people ought not to do. 
you should not reach through and pluck off someone's rib as he passes. I mean, there's an endless number of things. You should not pull people's hair out. You should not pull people's hair out even if you return it to them. I mean, you just a <laughs> thing after another, subcategory after subcategory, until finally you would literally have an infinitely long list of things a person really ought not to do. But instead, he simplified and said, love other people, love your neighbor as yourself. Cutting through all this and calling man to a positive ethic to do to others as he would have God do to him even. All right, I'd say that, uh, all right, granted that in general a positive approach is somewhat better than, than you know, setting a long list of negatives. Somewhat better? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, in, undoubtedly. But uh, there's still quite a bit of this negative aspect in Christianity, don't you think so? That's very true. There's a lot of the negative aspect in the religion about Jesus, the real religion of Jesus. I think what he taught is far more positive. Oh, I just wondered if people have ever prayed and got no answer. You know, even nice, devout Christians, and they pray and nothing happens. Sometimes the answer is no. They're getting an answer, and the answer is no, that a person is not ready at that time to receive what he thinks he wants. For another thing, sometimes people pray and are expecting one kind of an answer. They're expecting a material answer when the answer is going to be spiritual. So they're actually getting the answer sometimes in a changed attitude or a new insight. They get an answer, but it's not an answer that they expected. It's by simple faith that a person can accept that he's a son of God and accept the fact that he's infinitely loved by this Father. Prayer is not, after all, a way of getting God to do your will. It's quite the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. It's a way of taking God's will. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. And ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God? And to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, and Growing Spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery, the new power and purposeful resource inherent in living by faith. And another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. The mailing address box 347, Berkeley, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day.